Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Steve Took, again. Um, so, uh, one thing I just wanted to say is I'm really happy we don't have the stage here anymore. Um, <laughs> that was uh, the best moment of the conference for me so far, was just tumbling off the side in the first few minutes. Uh, it really helped with my nerves. Um, so, uh, but things get better, which is what we always try and do. Um, so, I am from Cucumber, and you probably all know about uh, Cucumber, the BDD testing tool thing, um, but Cucumber is also Cucumber Limited, uh, which is the organization behind Cucumber. Um, it was founded by uh, the core team, the people who build the tool, um, and it was founded to support the development of that tool. Um, so we do that by helping teams and organizations adopt BDD um, and adopt agile methods and just help people build better software um, and help people build the right software and help teams work together to build the right software. And that's what we try and do. Um, we're also in the middle of building a product called Cucumber Pro, um, which is um, kind of we think is the next step. Like we've got this tool Cucumber um, and we tell everyone to have these big conversations and collaboration things. And what do we do with the output of that? We write it in a text file and store it in a source code repository. Go on business people, you get access to that. I dare you. Um, so Cucumber Pro is intended to be uh, a window onto that source code repository. So uh, we elevate those features up to somewhere that the whole team get to access them. Okay, so uh, pitch over. Um, so I'd like to tell you a story. Um, I don't know if this is gonna translate, um, but Listen With Mother was a program, uh, a radio program uh, on Radio 4, uh, but it always used to begin, are you sitting comfortably? So let me begin. Once upon a time in a land not so far away, there was an entire industry beset by project failures and budget overruns. From all corners of the industry came different ideas about how to fix this problem, until one day, a group of consultants got together and wrote a unifying manifesto. Over the years, the words written in the manifesto became forgotten, but some of the consultants' ideas gained a following. Stand up user story, working software. But over time, the meanings of these words got lost. So, I'd like to talk about user stories. User stories, acceptance criteria or rules and examples, and how they relate to features and scenarios. So, we're at QCut. Hopefully, we've all got a pretty good idea of what feature files are. But, Let's go back and examine where they fit in our agile process. So I do a lot of consulting uh, and coaching, and I work with a whole range of organizations. Unfortunately, the thing is you rarely get to visit organizations that are doing things well. Um, and it's interesting, but it's also a challenge at times. So I was visiting one client a little while ago, and they were talking about how they do things, and they said to me, user stories, they're slippery. Okay. Uh, so I said, what do you do about these slippery user stories? Oh, we call them product backlog items. <laughs> so, okay, technically that's okay, but perhaps it's hiding some other little problems. Maybe they didn't really know what to do with user stories, and changing the name of something doesn't always make the problem go away. So here's some of the problems with user stories, the questions people ask about user stories. Um, and you know, they say that they're difficult to prioritize. There's nothing I can test. They're hard to estimate. We never finish them in an iteration. You know, so what's the root cause of these problems people have with user stories? Are they writing them badly? 
Is this a user story? So this is the Connextra template. So this was one way that someone suggested that people should write their user stories. So you should say who the story's for at the top. You should say what they want to do. And then you get to say what the value it provides is. Liz Keogh, she rearranged this because the value is the most important thing. So let's put the value at the top. So it's great, but are these really user stories? Does it matter if we fill in this template? They're just examples to help us to focus on what we need to build. So if you go back earlier in the Agile history, a user story was supposed to be a token for a conversation. Yeah, it's just a placeholder. It doesn't matter what you write in there, so long as there's enough context there so that you can have a conversation and figure out what it is you're going to do. So J.B. Rainsberger tried to encourage having conversations using this as a user story template. The thing is, different people want different things from user stories. So developers need the detail that they want to start coding. Testers need to understand what it is they're testing for. And scrum masters, product owners, they need to understand how to plan the release or plan the iteration, how long it's going to take to get some value. When are we going to be able to deliver something? So maybe we need different user stories. So um, there's an old blog post by Jeff Patton, um, and he says that user stories are boundary objects. So we can go to Wikipedia and we can find out what boundary objects are. And you find out that they're from sociology. So you go, oh, cool, science. I can feel smart. So, you, so boundary objects are plastic. They're interpreted differently across communities, but with enough immutable content to maintain integrity. Cool. So you can also go and find papers about boundary objects, scientific papers. So Leon Griesmeier said, uh, they are weakly structured in common use and become strongly structured in individual site use. They may be abstract or concrete. Well, that's kind of starting to become what user stories are, though, isn't it? We, we think about things that start as something very abstract, and they become more concrete. Maybe we add examples to them. They have different meanings in different social worlds, but their structure is common enough to more than one world to make them recognizable means of translation. OK, so we're talking about tech uh, and social. Um, so have you heard the one about, uh, uh, how does it go? Uh, how can you tell an extroverted developer? He's the one looking at your shoes. <laughs> Thank you. So, okay, so, so maybe we're not that social creatures as uh, people in tech, um, but it's still true that different people take different meanings from our user stories. The creation and management of boundary objects is key in developing and maintaining coherence across interesting social worlds. Okay, so it's key. This is the real like, core of the problem. We don't focus enough on our stories. We don't give them enough time. Just fitting them into a template isn't enough. So let's look at user stories in a bit more detail. Who's come across this? Yeah, so Mike Cohn's acronym, INVEST. If you haven't come across it, it's here. Um, and, you know, it's great. It, you know, it's Mike Cohen suggesting the properties that we need for a good user story. But like all acronyms, it's deeply, deeply flawed. Um, yeah, it's great. User stories, small, estimable. You know, we can get a feel for whether we can deliver them. Um, I like that you can negotiate them. But what does independent mean? You know, does it mean there's no links between our user stories? Of course there are. What about valuable? The stories have to give you all the functionality that it's exactly what the user wants? No, it doesn't. 
That's where, but that's what people have taken away. So they end up with user stories that are too big to finish in an iteration. They can't be delivered quickly, and they don't know how to build value in small slices. And that's what we want to get to. We want to get to low fidelity stories. Things are valuable as long as they're getting you closer to a goal. They might not give you all the functionality you need, but they give you that observable step towards where you're trying to get to. So again, um, Jeff Patton, uh, these are his graphics, but he talks about um, iterative and incremental delivery. So this is incremental delivery. So you start with um, a small piece, uh, high fidelity, then you add another small piece and another small piece until eventually the whole thing is finished. Okay, and then there's iterative, which is where you start with an outline sketch of the whole thing and you fill it in and fill it in until you get to the high fidelity thing you want at the end. You can do both together. So iter iterate and increment. So you start with a sketch and fill in a little piece of it and then fill that in in a bit more detail, then start filling in that piece and then that piece until eventually you get to the end. So you get smaller bits of work and you go piece by piece. And then, so it's a bit like a walking skeleton. And as you add those high fidelity stories at the end, you complete the picture. And you know, there's many, many of these pictures that we need to build for our product, and you can do them piece by piece. And sometimes you'll work on that piece, and sometimes you'll work on that piece, and you'll fill them in as you go until your whole product starts to get filled in. But the idea is we want to work it in small chunks to build up higher fidelity things as we go. So. BDD. How do we use BDD to find low fidelity stories? So I was talking about conversations yesterday, um, and they're an essential part of BDD. And so we call these uh, conversations, if we formalize them, they're discovery workshops, or Three Amigos meetings. So why are they called Three Amigos meetings? Anyone? Yeah, so we want someone from the product, someone from the from development, and someone from test at least involved in that conversation. And to that conversation, we bring user stories and acceptance criteria. So these user stories are the user stories that the product owner brings. They're often quite big. Maybe you'd call them epics. You know, they're high level. They define a whole capability. But in this, user, in this conversation, we can discuss those stories using concrete examples and explore the stories. And what we're trying to do is figure out if we can split this story down into smaller, low fidelity stories. So one of the great things is that out of this discovery workshop, we get more stories and acceptance criteria. We also find that we get open questions, so we start to learn about our domain. We get that shared understanding of the things that we didn't know we didn't know, so now we know that we don't know them so we can figure out how to solve them. And then, bringing it back to this session, what we're really looking for is some small, low fidelity stories. And they enable us to bring us a step closer to our final goal. And we want to split those epics down into something that we can use for development, something small enough that we can use for scheduling and planning. So there's a lot of ways to split a user story. And um, this is a great slide. It's a mind map um, from a guy called Richard Lawrence, Agile for All. Um, and it gives you a whole bunch of ways that you can split user stories. And I don't expect you to read it all now, um, but you can find it uh, on the internet at richardlawrence.info, splitting user stories. Um, and the slides will be published. Uh, so one of the ways that I really like to split user stories, though, is to use acceptance criteria. So the acceptance criteria really define the scope of a user story. And if you can find one or two of those acceptance criteria that you could deliver now or tomorrow or you know, at the end of the iteration, you're going to take that step closer to the goal. Yeah, you haven't got the whole functionality, but we're getting somewhere. We're starting to add behavior to our story. OK, so how about an example? 
here's uh, credit card processing. And here's a list of the acceptance criteria. So we have to support Visa. Uh, we don't need to support MasterCard or Switch. Customers should be prevented from entering their invalid credit card number. So in the discovery workshop, we're going to start to develop some concrete examples. We might want to give each example a name, like uh, the one where we validate content of the card number. So we like this Friends naming, Friends episode naming convention, the one where, like an episode of Friends. So we've got concrete examples of what inputs the user will put in, and we have concrete examples of the outputs that that will result in. We don't need a user, we don't need a UI, we don't need a database, any of that stuff. This is the example of what we expect to happen. But the great thing is, as soon as you write down these examples, your product owner can go, oh, hang on. I want them to be able to put spaces in there, because that's much better UX. So using those concrete examples helps us see patterns and helps generate more examples. That helps us find all the acceptance criteria we can use those acceptance criteria to define deliverable chunks of behavior. So user stories lead to acceptance criteria, which lead to examples, which in turn help us to discover further acceptance criteria and more stories. But what about feature files, Gherkin documents? So here's an example of a feature file. Can you see it OK at the back? So, you see that bit just below the feature line? That's called the description in Gherkin, technically. But it's basically an area of free text that you can use to add some context to the document. This is a document for people to read. So a lot of the BDD books and um, a couple of the tools will auto-generate that part for you. And in there, they'll put as a dot, 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 so that dot, 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 I want. And I don't know if it's a causal relationship or not, but it makes people think that features and stories have a one-to-one -one relationship. And I'd really, really like to dispel that myth. Um, so what I like to put up there is the acceptance criteria or the rules of what I'm working on. So this is a feature file from a web app. Uh, it allows competitors to submit answers and then get scored on those answers. But this isn't how this feature file started. This was a story that we began with. So in order to introduce a competitive element, participants should be able to get points for a successful answer. It's quite vague, but you know, it was enough for us to get started. So um, we started to think about what the acceptance criteria were from that. And, um, you know, just a quick sketch, that was what we thought about. If you, give, if, you give, if you get the correct answer, you get some points. It's pretty straightforward. So we did a discovery workshop. Sat down with our three amigos, all of them, me, me, and me. Um, and I asked myself some questions. So the team, st the team start with a score of zero. What happens if the answer's wrong? Are all answers worth the same? And so on. And through doing that, I was able to come up with a longer list of acceptance criteria. So it's probably not exhaustive, but you get the idea. We've got four acceptance criteria, three acceptance criteria. So I started with the simplest, because that would get me going. And I went to my feature file, my Gherkin specification, and I wrote this up. So I register a team, get my score, it's zero. Great, so now I had a failing acceptance test. So I could go into my TDD loop and I write some unit tests, make the test pass, keep the code nice and clean, keep going until eventually my, my failing acceptance test became a passing acceptance test. Fantastic, I'm done with that acceptance criteria. Grab the next one. A correct answer gets 10 points. Okay. A correct answer gets 10 points. So, I added an acceptance criteria to the top of the file, and then I added a scenario. So, I can register a team, submit a correct answer. 
I get 10 points. Great. So we're starting to build up our little uh, application in little tiny steps. So we can go and get the next acceptance criteria. You get more points for an answer depending on its difficulty. So if, uh, if you answer harder questions correctly, you get more points. That sounds like a, a fair game. So, although I've added another scenario here, there's something else gone on. What, what else has happened here? Sorry? I've refined the old example, yeah. So I've, I've actually added some domain-specific domain language. Yeah, we're talking about the language of our application here. We've got easy answers and hard answers. And I get more points for my easy, uh, hard answers than my easy answers. So those acceptance criteria that we were working through, you can think of those as low-fidelity stories. And there's not a one-to-one -one relationship between each of those low-fidelity stories and feature files. We've had one feature file, and those low-fidelity stories have added to it and modified it and made it better, more representative of our document, of our system. And you might even get stories that delete scenarios and feature files. Okay, so we've talked about user stories having many roles. And one of the most important of those roles is planning and scheduling the work. Feature files specify what the software does or what you want the software to do very soon. Okay, so this is how I think that user stories relate to feature files. The examples that we generate, they become our scenarios in our Gherkin documents. And then once you've recorded them in the feature file, you can throw the examples away. The acceptance criteria belongs up at the top. It tells us what this, these scenarios are illustrating. It gives us some explanation of what it's done. And once you've put those into the feature file, you can throw those away. And then once your feature is complete and finished working, it's passing, you're done, what can you do with your user story? Throw it away. The features and scenarios evolve, but they're a persistent specification of the system. The source of truth. The user stories are ephemeral, disposable. Once they're completed, you don't need it. Because the behavior, is added, the behavior added to the system is documented in the source of truth. There's no point keeping them around. Finally, there are things that aren't user stories. For example, updating the version of your server software. You have to schedule and plan it. You know, add in a new logging framework, make some changes to the architecture. Things that you might be able to justify from a technical perspective, but they're not user stories. You can track them with cards or Jira or Trello, but they're under control of the technical team, not your product owner wants or even knows how to prioritize against all the other things. Thank you. Any questions? I was always wondering how we could efficiently use multiple feature files, how to self-organize those. As we grow in the organization, there'll be like heaps and heaps of feature files. How, to, how is your vision on uh, collating those, making sense of it, linking them together, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the question is, um, how do you organize feature files, lots and lots of them, collate them together? Um, so I think I, right now the best way of doing it is using uh, directories for areas of capabilities and then a feature file per capability so that it helps you describe what the system does and it, it helps you understand what all those features are. Um, you can also use tags. So tags in Cucumber... Um, are often used for selecting which ones to run and what to do, but they are meant to be that cross-cutting concern. Um, and exactly how you pull things out using those depends on your, your environment. There are some tools to help you do that, but um, I think you, you treat your whole uh, directory of features as, as one big document, and the uh, folders inside that is like the table of contents. We need to keep a tighter control on the features we develop. Um, but if we are collaborating within a team, we might end up writing duplicate features 
So is there a way to manage or detect those, or is there an overlooking tool that can do that? There, there isn't a tool uh, out of private beta right now that can help you with that, that I know of. There will, um, be, will be soon, right? Yeah, hopefully. It's coming. Uh, so Cucumber Pro, this is exactly what we're trying to do with Cucumber Pro, is help teams really get a hold of it. But even if, you, like, even whatever tool you have, the thing is it needs somebody to take care of it. Yeah, so somebody on the team has to be the person who, um, who is going to take responsibility for making sure that your, uh, all of your features make sense as a coherent thing. They are the specification of the system. They're supposed to describe what it does. And um, you need to treat them in the same way as you treat other parts of your system. And you need to care for them and tend them and look after them and cuddle them. Uh, thanks for that. You've mentioned that we shouldn't be keeping some of our technical related items in a backlog sort of things. Now, if I don't do that, how would my product owners or would know that how much capacity do I have to actually work on the stories that they're asking me to? Right, so um, I didn't mean to say that you shouldn't keep them in the backlog, but I think you should maybe uh, identify them differently from user stories. Yeah, so... so yeah, you, you need some way of tracking them and scheduling them, but your product owner has to take, at some point, the guidance from the technical team of how important this thing is. Um, they can, they can prioritise the value of um, the, the work that needs to be done to deliver value to the customers, but what they can't do is, is necessarily make uh, good technical decisions about whether we really need to update the database now. Um, but if you can say to them, well, if we don't update the database now, there's a really good chance that all of our passwords are going to be given to hackers from a country we don't like, then uh, they're probably going to say, well, you prob if you say we have to get on and do it, let's get on and do it. Um, but I think in terms of capacity planning, I've seen a, f a few teams do some good things. Like um, there's a bunch of guys in London called Unruly, um, Unruly Media. And they have uh, white cards and green cards on their wall. And green cards are um, technical stories and white cards are business stories. And they, they only estimate and plan velocity based on the white cards and the technical team to decide which green cards they're going to do. And if doing all the green cards means that their velocity drops to zero, then that starts a really good discussion in the retrospective. Any more? No? Okay. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Dave.